It's time for us to begin tonight. Appreciate your being here. Appreciate those that have joined in on the internet. Uh, it's always good to be able to get together and study God's Word and, and uh, appreciate all who are willing to do that. As you know, we've been studying Old Testament characters and we will continue that study tonight. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in Heaven, we're just so thankful that we can be here this evening, that we can study Your Word, and we just thank You for revealing to us these people from the Old Testament that help us to be able to know what to do, what not to do, and how to live for You better. And we just pray You'll help us to imitate the faith of those that were faithful. And we pray You'll be with those that are sick. We ask You to help them to get well. We pray that You'll be with our nation and bless us as a country that we can follow your will and that we can in fact be what you want us to be. We pray that you'll give us wisdom, be with the church here at Ephesus, that we'll uh, follow your word and that we'll be the church you want us to be. Forgive us when we do wrong, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are ready to talk about David. Now David is a Probably next to Abraham is probably one of the more prominent Old Testament characters. And as far as the lineage of Christ is concerned, probably next to Abraham, David is one that is talked about the most and, and maybe even sometimes more than Abraham uh, because David was a special king. He was not the first king, but he was a very special king uh, in the history of Israel. Uh, and so it was the promise was made to him by God that his descendants would reign forever. And this was a prophecy of the Messiah, the prophecy of the coming of Christ. And so as we look at the coming of Jesus Christ through the Old Testament history, uh, David then plays a very prominent role uh, in, in the lineage of Jesus. And so uh, we, we talk about David. We talked last week about Saul, who was the first king of Israel. And of course, in order to study the the story of Saul, you have to study the story of David, uh, because about the first half of what's told to us about David uh, is told to us mixed in with Saul as king. Saul, you remember, be, was appointed king by God, uh, and then he did not obey God uh, a couple of times in offering up sacrifice when he was told to wait by Samuel, and then later when he went to, to fight against the Amalekites. And God told him, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you. I'm going to give it to one who has, uh, is a man after my own heart. And David is referred to uh, two or three times as a man after God's own heart. And so David is the one who, who was given uh, the kingdom. In 1 Samuel 16, David is anointed king. I want us tonight, instead of just really looking at the stories themselves, I want us to think about David. And I want you to, to help me try to understand David as a person. He's anointed as king. Saul is already king. God has said Saul's going to be removed. David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. And that's in chapter uh, 16. And then chapter 17, David... Uh, we read the story of David when he goes to kill Goliath. Where was David before that? He was tending the sheep and his father said, I want you to go check on your brothers. Now he's already been anointed king, but here he is back home taking care of the sheep. Uh, what does that tell you about David? As, as in his mind, his thinking. Okay. Okay, it may not have totally sunk in yet, that, that is a possibility, but I think it definitely shows the lack of any kind of presumption on his part. He goes and he fights against Goliath, and he, he, you remember he killed Goliath, and we talked about that last week, and then he, co he begins to lead the army of, David, of Saul. And so he, he becomes very prominent in the kingdom as, as a soldier, and he becomes very, very close friends with Jonathan, the son of Saul. But from the very beginning of this friendship, Jonathan tells David, you're going to be the next king. So Saul knew it, Jonathan knew it, uh, and, and David knew it. And yet David does not make any effort whatsoever 
to speed it up or to take the kingdom on his own. What, what does that tell you about it? Okay, he's, he's, he is content to let things go the way God wants them to go. When God's ready for him to become king, then he will. And so, then in chapter 19, you find David, the evil spirit comes on Saul, and David is playing the harp to soothe Saul, which would be somewhat of a menial task uh, at best in the palace. And Saul tries to kill him, he throws a spear at him, you remember, uh, and he escaped. Uh, so again, you see David, without any kind of presumption, trying to take the kingdom uh, for himself. In chapter 20, he makes a covenant with Jonathan. Uh, and then in chapter 24, uh, we talked about very briefly last week, is when it says that Saul was after David. He was trying to hunt him down. He had an army with him. Uh, and Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. And David and his men were in the back of the cave uh, and he, you remember he cut off the edge of Saul's uh, robe. And then after Saul went back out and, and was a little distance away, David goes out and he says, Look, I, I'm not trying to do you any harm. I'm not trying to kill you or hurt you. If I could, if I was, I would have killed you. Uh, but instead of that, uh, he said, I, I'm not doing you any harm. He said, Why do you keep chasing me? And Saul says, You're a better man than I am. And so Saul made him a promise then that he would not chase him anymore and would not try to kill him. That lasted about a week and then he was, he was after him again. But uh, he, he at least got his attention. And then in chapter 25, uh, you have a story of Nabal and David. Nabal was a very wealthy uh, sheep herder. Uh, he had a lot of sheep. And his... His men that took care of the sheep were all in the area where David and his men were staying. And so David had protected them. He had just sort of been a shield for them and he had protected them against uh, any kind of invaders and intruders and bandits or whatever uh, because shepherds tended uh, for the most part to be uh, somewhat vulnerable uh, to, to marauders and bands like that. But David and his men had protected them. Well, when it came time to shear the sheep, Nabal was throwing a big banquet and he was going to have this big feast. And so, so David sent some of his men and said, go to Nabal and say, look, we've been helping you. We've been taking care of your men. Uh, we've looked after your sheep. And now we'd like for you to give us something to eat. And Nabal says, basically, just to paraphrase, he said, you're crazy. He said, who is David? I'm not going to give you anything. Uh, he said, these people come and go, and the, even Nabal's men tried to get Nabal to do it because he, they said he has helped us. Well, when the word got back to David, his men got back and told David, David became extremely angry. And he took his soldiers, and he was going up, and he was going to kill Nabal and everything that belonged to Nabal and take it for himself. Well, Nabal's wife named Abigail, and one of the men... One of the servants went and told Abigail what was going on uh, and what Nabal had done. And uh, she immediately fixed some provisions. She went up and met David before he could get to, to Nabal. Uh, and she intervened on Nabal's behalf. And she said, he is as his name. And the word Nabal means fool. And she said, that's really what he is. And he was drunk and, and he has acted foolishly and said, here, take these provisions uh, from me, and, uh, you know, and I, I apologize for what my husband has done, and, and said, please don't, uh, you know, kill him because of that. You'll have his blood on your hands. And, and David said, as surely as the Lord lives, if you had not intervened by tonight, he and all of his people would have been dead. Uh, but said, you have done the right thing by intervening, uh, like you have done, and kept me from shedding blood. What does that tell you about David? First of all, his reaction, what does that tell you? <laughs> he was just like anybody else, wasn't he? He was human. Here he had put forth a lot of effort to look out for Nabal's possessions and his people and stuff, 
And then Nabal treated him like that and it made him mad. So David, David wasn't some kind of superhuman that, you know, sometimes we say, well, he was a man after God's own heart. And so we think, you know, he wrote all these beautiful psalms and he played the harp. So surely he wasn't. No, he's just like me and you. And he got mad about it. Uh, and he was going up there and he was going to kill Nabal and everybody that belonged to him. What does it tell you about him when Abigail came to him? His reaction to her. Okay, he was willing to listen to reason and admit that he was wrong. And I think this is a, is a demonstration of his heart. This is why he is said to be a man after God's own heart. David made mistakes. David sinned. David did things that were wrong. And David made some bad decisions. But every single time when it was pointed out to him, he immediately admitted that he was wrong, number one. And number two, he changed and tried to correct it or do something about it. And I think that tells you why he is referred to as a man after God's own heart. Uh, I, I think that that demonstrates the kind of person uh, that he was. Um, in chapter 26 of 1 Samuel, uh, Saul and his men again were hunting David. Uh, and, and David took a couple of his soldiers with him and went down into the camp at night. And Saul's spear was in the ground, stuck in the ground next to his head. Uh, and he took that spear and a couple other things uh, of Saul's. And then the next morning, he stood across the, on the opposite mountainside across the valley and called out to, to Saul and to Abner, who was the captain of Saul's army. And he said, told Abner, he said, you're supposed to be protecting uh, your Lord King Saul and you didn't do a very good job because I came into your camp and I got his sword and, and this other stuff that belonged to him. And he said, I could have killed him, but I didn't. And again, Saul said, you're more righteous than I am, and, and I'm going to quit hunting you. And, uh, so that, that sort of uh, is the end of that. And then the last chapter of 1 Samuel and goes into the first chapter of 2 Samuel. Saul has gone to battle against the Philistines. And he was defeated in the battle. He was killed. Uh, Jonathan, his son, was killed. And remember, Jonathan and David were extremely close and had made covenants with each other uh, and they both were killed. There was an Amalekite who came to David and he told him, he said, I was coming along and, and King Saul and, and Jonathan his son are dead. And he said, how, so David said, how do you know they're dead? He said, well, I was coming along and Saul had been wounded and he was about to fall on his own spear and he asked me to kill him and so I killed him. And so I know he's dead. David said, you are judged by your own words. You have killed the anointed of the Lord. And so he put the man to death for killing Saul. I think that speaks volumes about David. And then he led a lament. He, he did, wrote a song and led a lament for Israel to mourn Saul and Jonathan. If you think about it, here's a man that is going to be the next king. As soon as Saul is dead, God has already told him, you're going to be the next king. How would we react if we were in David's position and we got word that Saul was killed? Well, yeah, it'd be like winning the lottery. You're right. You know, here all of a sudden it looks like, you know, everything's, boy, it's, it's, this is what I've been waiting for. Now I'm going to get to be king. No, that wasn't David's reaction at all. It was just the opposite of that. He mourned and he, he told everybody else to mourn. And, and so uh, he, it, it tells you, I think it tells you a whole lot about Saul. I mean, about David and his attitude because of that. The people of Judah came to David and, and said, we want you to be our king. The only problem was Ishbosheth, who was the son of Saul, uh, became king over Israel. He just took his father's place. 
Abner was the captain of the army for Saul, and so he was the captain of the army for Ishbosheth. Joab uh, was the captain of David's army. And so Joab and Abner fought back and forth uh, for a, a chapter or so there. Uh, you have this internal battle going on between Israel and Judah uh, with David's men and Ishbosheth's men, uh, Jonathan uh, or Joab and Abner fighting against each other. Finally, Ishbosheth uh, accused Abner falsely of, of doing of being immoral with one of the the women that had belonged to Saul. Uh, and this really made Abner mad. He said, you only have the position you have because I put you there. And without me, you won't stay there. And so he went to David and he told him, he said, I'm ready to, to turn the northern tribes over to you uh, so that you can be king over all of Israel. And so David and, and Abner made a, an agreement. And Abner left in peace from David going up uh, to talk to the people in Israel to try to get them to come down. Uh, and, and he had already talked to the, the leaders of Israel, and they had already agreed. So it was just a formality now of getting them all together so that they could anoint David as king officially over all of Israel. Joab was not present when this happened. And so when Joab found out about it, uh, he... Uh, He went out and he, he had his men bring Abner back. And then he killed Abner. Uh, David, first of all, told Joab that he would be punished for that at some point. He doesn't tell him when, but he says he will be. And then David mourned Abner's death. And again, he led all of Israel in the mourning of Abner's death. Uh, this really bonded the people to David because they realized and that David, there, there was nothing in David that was, was pretentious or nothing in David that was overly ambitious in trying to, to take, excuse me, take over the kingdom or any of that. He just simply was letting God's plan unfold in his life. Uh, and, and I think that that, is a tremendous lesson for us uh, to, to let God's timing have its place. Actually, later, when David is on his deathbed, he tells his son Solomon, he said, I want you to deal with Joab. <laughs> he said, you'll know what to do. And so... Solomon killed Joab, uh, or had him killed, uh, be, because of what he had done. Uh, the, let me just back up. If you go back to uh, chapter 2, the reason Joab wanted to kill Abner was not so much that he was the captain of the army, but Abner had killed his younger brother. Uh, I believe it was Abishai. Was it Abishai or Hithophel? Uh, anyway, he was chasing Abner, and Abner told him to turn around and quit chasing him, and, and uh, he kept on. He wouldn't stop uh, Asahel. Uh, and uh, so Abner just took the butt of his spear and apparently just stopped and held the spear back, and Asahel was running so fast that he hit the spear, and it went all the way through him, and the butt of the spear went through him and killed him. Uh, and so Joab, for this reason, Joab killed Abner. Ishbosheth, who was the son of Saul, who had been king over Israel, uh, was still in his position officially. And there were two men, uh, it says there were worthless men, Rechab and Benaiah. And they were brothers, and they went in to Ishbosheth, and they killed him, and they cut off his head, and they took his head to David. And said that, uh, look what we did. We killed Ishbosheth for you. And they were expecting a reward uh, because that would have been the normal procedures to have Ishbosheth killed. And and but because he was the son of Saul, uh, David 
said, said, you have murdered a man who was innocent and you killed him in his own bed. Uh, and so he had both uh, of these two men, Rechab and Benaiah, uh, put to death because they killed Ishbosheth. One, one of, and then chapter 5, David's made king over all of Israel. One of the things that I see in David is he's in a position uh, now in, in, at this point of being king over all of Israel. But he never lost sight of the fact that he was there because God put him there. And so his job as king was not for any kind of personal gain or personal aggrandizement or anything else like that. But his job as king was to honor God and to bring glory to God through the nation of Israel. And so every time he went out to battle, he, he talks several times, and I didn't count the number of times I read it, but several times throughout 2 Samuel, he refers to God as the God of the armies of Israel. Uh, and, and so every time he goes out to battle, a victory is not so much a victory for David, and it's, and it's only a victory for Israel in that it, Israel was God's people. It was a victory for God. And that's how David looked at it every time he went out to battle. And so anybody that was an enemy of David was an enemy of God. And he was willing, and we'll see here in just a few minutes, he was willing to let God take care of it. Now this is what he had done with Saul. When, when Joab and, and when uh, Joab's brothers wanted to kill Saul on both occasions, David said, I cannot raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. When God gets ready for me to be king, He'll make me king. And he said, I, I'm, I'm going to wait on that. And I think, again, this, this tells us a whole lot about David as a person and the kind of person he was. It wasn't, it wasn't about David. There, even though he, he was recognized as the greatest king of Israel, Never, except at the very end of his of Second Samuel, we'll find that he he did mess up in this respect. But but that's the only time that I know of that that he really did anything just for his own personal glory or to to feel good about himself. It was always about what he could do for God and how he could bring honor and glory to God. And I think there's a, a real lesson for that in that for us. It doesn't matter whether it's you know, a preacher or a Bible class teacher or if uh, you know, we're a song leader or if we're teaching a class or if we're just one of the people that's here to, to help worship God and, and be a part of the, the assembly and, and do our part, whatever that is, whether it's public or not. The fact is, we are Christians so we can honor God and so we can glorify God. And it should be that everything in our life, whether it's a part of the church work or if it's part of our family life or school life or work life or neighborhood life or whatever it is, that we do what we do to honor God. And that should be our motive. That should be our goal in all that we do. It's not about me. It's not about what, you know, what I can accomplish. It's not about what... People will, you know, say about me or think about me. Uh, I've, I've told you before about a man that I knew uh, one time, and he had he'd been an elder in, in the Lord's Church for a number of, of years. And uh, over due to some circumstances that took place, he he was uh, the the church actually ended up not having any elders for a little while, and so he was not an elder, and then. He was not put back in as an elder. And, and he made the statement to me. He said, you know, Robert, he said, you know the, the thing I hate most of all about not being an elder? And I said, what's that? He said, when I go and visit other churches, he said, they'd always call on me to lead a prayer and they would 
uh, when they would ask me to lead the prayer, they would always announce that I was an elder at the church at so-and-so. And he said, oh, they won't do that anymore. And he said, he said that hurts. Well, I, you know, it's, it's not about that. That's, it was, you know, that's the wrong reason for being an elder is to be recognized by other people as being an elder in the church. The only reason for being an elder is to do a good work, to do a good job. The only reason for being a preacher is to preach the gospel. And the only reason to be a Bible teacher is to teach the Bible. It's not about, you know, what people are going to say about Robert or how, what a good job he did or something else. And of course, I want to do a good job, whether it's preaching or teaching or whatever. But only, it should only be for the purpose of glorifying God, not for my own personal benefit. All right, questions or comments? All right. The Philistines had killed Saul, they had killed Jonathan, and they had also taken the Ark of the Covenant, you remember. It had gotten back to Israel. They'd gotten it earlier. They'd sent it back to Israel, but it, it was, if I remember correctly, at the house of Abinadab, uh, I believe that's right. Uh, and David decided it was time... He had conquered the city of what became known as Jerusalem. He had made that the capital city of, of Israel. Uh, and so that was where he was now. And he decided it was time to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to uh, Jerusalem where he was. He made a new cart or had a new cart made and he took uh, oxen and uh, and they put the cart, they put the Ark of the Covenant on the, the cart, and they began transporting it. And they would go just a, a little ways, and they'd offer up a sacrifice, and they'd go a little ways more, and they'd offer up another sacrifice. Uh, and they were really, I mean, this was a big thing, bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to, to the city of David. The oxen stumbled, and the Ark almost fell off of the cart. And one of the men that was going along beside it was uh, his two brothers, Uzzah and Ahio, uh, were the two brothers. And Uzzah just reached his hand up to keep the ark from falling. And when he touched the ark, God struck him dead. Now what was wrong with... The, and David got mad about it, incidentally. David got mad at God because he struck him dead. And then it says he was afraid of God because God struck him dead. And then he decided, I'm going to leave this ark here. I'm not, going, I'm not even going to mess with it anymore because of what's happened. Uh, and so he put it in somebody else's house and uh, they, they were blessed greatly because of it. So in a very short time, he decided to go ahead and bring the ark on up to Jerusalem. But what was wrong with the picture of, of how they were doing what they were doing? Do what? Okay, the ark had been made with rings, with gold rings on it. If I remember correctly, it was six of them, three on each side. And they had these poles that were made that were gold plated. And they would stick the poles through these rings. And four of the priests would carry the ark. Actually, four of the family of Kohath. Uh, they were responsible for transporting the furniture of the tabernacle, the family of Kohath. And so it would be six of them, and, and, and us and Ahio were from the family of Kohath. Uh, so they should have known how they were supposed to transport it. It was not like they were, you know, strangers that didn't know this. They were, they were from the family of the Levites that had the responsibility of transporting the articles of the tabernacle. And so they, they had the instructions. So instead of carrying it by hand like they were supposed to, they put it on a cart. But, I mean, it was going to fall and it might have broken, so why would God strike him dead for saving it? Okay. He said, don't touch the Ark of the Covenant or you'll die. You go back and, and look when the ark was made, when it was consecrated. 
He said, you carry it with these rings and if you touch it, you'll die. Uzzah touched it and he died. He should have known it, yes. Uh, because he probably just felt like he could do a better job. Of I mean, it's, it's a good distance. It's a long ways. And so rather than make these guys carry it, it just, it just made more sense to put it on the cart. And, and you see, David, David was a lot like us in a lot of ways. He had a better plan than God's plan, and he thought it would work better. And, and it's easy for us to do the same thing. It, people do it all the time. We, we think we've got an idea that, you know, God said do this, but we think it makes more sense to do it a different way or do something different, and, and so we do it our way. And that's exactly what David uh, was doing here. Uh, but Uzzah was, was struck dead. Now, after the ark stayed there for a while and, and the, they were being blessed because of it, David decided, okay, it's time to go get the ark and to, to move it back. And this is in 2 Samuel 6, incidentally, if you didn't already find it. Uh, and so they, they took it to the house of Obed-Edom uh, and it stayed there for three months and then David went to get it. This time, David carried it like he was supposed to carry it. He had the Levites to carry it with the poles as they were supposed to do. Uh, and so it says that, that he, uh, when the bearers of the ark went six paces, he offered up an ox and a fatling. Uh, so, I mean, they were offering up sacrifices and they were, they were doing it right this time. And David was dancing before the Lord. And uh, so Michael, his, one of his wives, who was the daughter of Saul, saw him and she rebuked him for the way he was dancing uh, and because of, of that, uh, he said, uh, I'll be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes, but with the maids of whom you've spoken with, whom I, with them, I'll be distinguished. In other words, David was king and she didn't have any business talking to him the way she did. And so uh, because of that, it says that uh, she had no child to the day of her death. Um, so that was getting the ark back to, to, to Jerusalem. Chapter 7, David told Nathan the prophet, he said, uh, let me back up. When David became king, uh, the king of Tyre uh, sent men with all the material and built David a palace. Is a house made of cedar. Uh, his name uh, was Hiram. And he built this house made of cedar. Uh, David lived in this big, huge palace. And so he told Nathan, the prophet, he said, it's just not right for me to live in this big, fancy house. And, and God uh, has a tabernacle, which was a tent. He said, I want to build a big temple, a house for God. And Nathan said, that sounds great. Said, you go ahead and do it. Well, Nathan didn't even get out of, the, out of the palace good. And God spoke to him and said, you go back and you tell David that he's not going to build me a house. He said, and so the Lord told David, he said, all these years I've not lived in a house and I've, I've done fine. Uh, I've dwelt in a tent. And he said, uh, you're not going to build me one, but your son can and we find later he explains to him because David was a man of blood, because he was a soldier, he had conquered all of the enemies around him and he had, he had been a man of blood for basically his whole life. Uh, God said, you're not going to build me the temple, but your son Solomon will be allowed to build the temple. So David spent the rest of his life uh, from this point on really getting things ready to build the temple, uh, getting the stuff together and so on, uh, so that Solomon, his son, uh, could build the temple. In chapter 9, any questions? Uh, Y'all making me do a lot of talking now. 
In chapter 9, David had made a vow to Jonathan that he would be kind and show kindness to the descendants of Jonathan. And so he sent word, uh, he said, go find out if there's anybody in Saul's house that's still living, and especially in Jonathan's house. And so uh, they came back and they said, yes, there is a servant of Saul named Ziba. And so he called Ziba in and he said, is there any of the descendants of Saul or Jonathan left? And he said, yes, there is one son of Jonathan named Mephibosheth. And he's lame in both of his feet. And then David said, you go get him and bring him to me. Now can you imagine what Mephibosheth was thinking on that trip going in to see David? Uh, he is the last living heir of Saul. And here David calls for him to come in. And he said, Mephibosheth, since you are Jonathan's son, I swore that I would show kindness to Jonathan's descendants. So everything that belonged to King Saul, I'm going to give to you. And Ziba is going to be your servant. And he's going to look after everything. He's going to tend to it for you. And you're going to live right here in Jerusalem. And you will eat at the king's table like one of the sons of the king. And so from that day on, Mephibosheth ate at the king's table as though he were one of the sons of the king. Now that was unheard of. To do that. Any king in that time period at all would have killed anybody that was a descendant of the previous king. He for sure would not have let him live. But David had sworn to Jonathan that he would show kindness to his descendants and he kept his word. And again, it tells us something about David. Uh, he, number one, he was sure in the fact that he was the king and God made him king. And secondly, he he made made a vow and he kept his vow, and so I think that's an extremely important thing. Chapter eleven is the story of Bathsheba. You remember that David saw her and he called for her. He committed adultery with her. She found out she was pregnant. Her husband was Uriah, uh, and he was a soldier. And so David uh, sent word to Joab. Uh, to put Uriah on the front lines and then when the battle got hot to withdraw so that Uriah would be killed. Uh, and then he took Bathsheba as his wife. Uh, he did all of that to hide the fact uh, that she was carrying his child. God was not pleased with this. Uh, and so he sent Nathan the prophet and Nathan went to David and he said, I want to tell you a story of something that's happened. He said there was this very wealthy man and he had all these flocks and herds and he had a visitor come see him and then one of his neighbors was a poor man who had one ewe lamb and this ewe lamb was like a daughter to him and he would feed it from the table and he kept it in the house and, and this rich man took that man, poor man's ewe lamb and killed it to feed his guest. Boy, David was angry. David was mad. He said, surely whoever did this is going to die. And Nathan looked at David and he said, you are the man. David was king of Israel. He, he had at least uh, somewhere, by best I could count, somewhere between six and ten wives. So he, he could have as many wives as he wanted. But he took Uriah's wife. And it's interesting that in chapter 12 where Nathan rebukes David and where God speaks to David, uh, every single time that he talks about it, God refers to him as saying, you took Uriah's wife. Uh, I mean, you took Uriah, yeah, you took Uriah's wife. And so when, he, when God refers to Bathsheba every time, it is Uriah's wife. Uh, and so David, he told David, because of this, uh, you will have uh, trouble in your family from now on and the child that is born will die. And so sure enough, this did happen and, and the child died. 
All right, I'd like for us to pick up and just think a little bit and talk a little bit next week about this event of Bathsheba and David and Uriah and, and some things about that. There's some, some stuff I want to talk about with that. So be thinking about that story, chapter uh, 11 and 12, uh, and then we will finish up with David and uh, probably move on. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, we'll talk about Solomon. I, I wasn't sure which king, but we'll talk about Solomon, and probably after that we will jump to some other kings, one or two, and then one or two prophets we'll talk about, and then we'll conclude our uh, Old Testament characters. All right. Any questions or comments? All right, we'll stop with that. fixing dressing this morning at 7 30. I'll let my mom do that. Well, I usually do it for the family. Yeah. You never know.
Let's pray. But dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to thee for this beautiful day that you've given us. Father, for this privilege and opportunity we have to come together tonight to study another portion of your word. And we pray, Father, that our, worship, our, our study and our worship tonight has been acceptable in your sight, that it's been fruitful for us and learning more about you and what, how you would have us to serve you. We are so thankful to thee, Father, for all the many blessings in life that you provide us with from day to day for the necessities, food, shelter, and clothing, but we recognize that above all, above these things, you bless us so richly, Father, we'll give you the praise and honor and the glory for those those uh, temporal things here on this uh, during this life on this earth. But Father, we especially thank thee for the spiritual blessings we have in Christ Jesus and your love and showing, uh, showing uh, you're showing your love for us and sending him to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, Father. We just thank Thee for this great sacrifice and pray that You would help us to always remember that great sacrifice, to live it out in our everyday lives, to spread the gospel to others, the good news of, of Jesus and the story of His sacrifice on our, on our behalf for our sins, Father. Just help us as we go through life to live in view of the cross. We are thankful to Thee, Father, for the church that He established, He purchased with His blood. We pray, Father, that You be with Ephesus here as we strive to be a congregation of that church. Father, we just pray that You would bless us in our efforts, that much fruit can be gathered in Your name as we strive to worship Thee and serve Thee here. Father, we're thankful to Thee for those who lead us here, for our good elders, and we pray, Father, Your, your richest blessings on them. Pray that you would give them wisdom to lead us in the way that that uh, is pleasing and acceptable to, acceptable to thee. And likewise, Father, we, we thank for thee for those who serve the church here, for those who serve as deacons, and for others that serve in other capacities uh, from day to day and from time to time. Father, we just pray for your richest blessings on them as they try to serve thee and do, do your will. We're thankful to thee, Father, for those who are able to teach and preach the gospel from the pulpit. And we're thankful to thee, Father, for Brother Robert and Brother Matt as they labor here with us, and we pray your continued blessings on them as they as they labor with us. Father, we as we come to this time of the year when we have this special time set aside to uh, this one day to be thankful and as Thanksgiving, Father, help us to realize we should be thankful to thee every day for all the many blessings that you give us. Help us to have thanksgiving every day in that respect where we recognize the great gifts that you give us in this life and in the life to come, Father. And we pray that you would always always help us to remember those things, no matter how, how life is going, no matter how, what things happen. And especially in a year such as this where so many tumultuous things have happened, Father, with this current pandemic and all the violence and uprisings and the uh, elections, Father, where reminded that even though all those those uh, tumultuous things are happening here around us on this earth, Father, that you are still God. You're still ever-present, ever-knowing, that you're with us no matter what, that your promise to never leave us or forsake us still stands, and that you're with us throughout uh, these these tumultuous times. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to be with us as, as our nation goes through that. And we are thankful, to you, Father, for the nation that we live in, for we, we realize that we have so many freedoms and we're thankful to thee, Father, that we were able to be born in a country such as this, that we uh, are able to worship as we are tonight to, without fear. We pray, Father, that that would continue, that your blessings would continue in that respect. But, Father, we, we, we struggle to thank thee for everything that you've done for us and uh, a prayer such as this would be insufficient to cover all those things, but we do thank Thee, Father, for everything that You give us, for the love that You've shown us, and all that You've done, both here on earth for us, and for the life, and for Your Son Jesus and His sacrifice. And we we extend those things to Thee, Father. We we pray, Father, that You would forgive us when we do wrong, for we realize we do fail so often, and we fall short of Your glory. And we pray, Father, that You would forgive us. Help us to turn from the things that hinder us and do the things that we need to do. That we will be, that we will glorify Your name by our lives. Father, we pray for those of our number that are that are sick at this time. We pray that You would restore their health if it be Your will, Father. We pray, Father, especially for Brother Joel as he goes through surgery next week. And pray, Father, that it will be successful. 
Pray for others, Father, who are going through treatments and surgeries and who are sick with the virus right now. We pray, Father, your blessings on them. And, like, and likewise, Father, for those who are grieving, we pray for them and pray your comfort upon them as they go through this, this troubling time. Father, continue with us throughout the remainder of this service tonight and throughout our future walks of life. And when this life is over, Father, we pray that by your grace and mercy that you'll uh, reward us with the home in heaven that you've promised. We pray in Jesus' name. Come for the lessons now will be number five hundred eight fifty three. Five eight hundred fifty three. Whatever it is up there. <laughs> Matthew 28, there in verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes was as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Every time I read these passages, it, it sends chills up my spine because you think about this event. If, it, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, we would not have a hope of eternal life. If Jesus just died, it would have just been a, another good man who had lived and and died, but he didn't. He rose from the dead, and in that act, he conquered Satan, and he conquered death, and because of that, now we, too, can conquer Satan and conquer death if we are buried, just like Jesus was buried in that water grave of baptism, and when we raise up, just as Jesus raised up, we, too, can be raised up and to walk in a newness of life, and as we are in this time of thanksgiving, there are a lot of things that we can be thankful for in this world, and, and no, no time as we're in right now should we be thankful for what we have. But let us never forget what Jesus did for us on that day and, and the love that God's shown for us and that we need to be thankful for that sacrifice and for God's power to raise Jesus from the dead. And because of that, each of us can have a life with, in heaven with Him for eternity. And so tonight, if, if you are here and you're not a Christian, one thing you need to be thankful for is God's patience. Because God has been patient with you. You never know when God's patience is going to run out. And so tonight, you need to accept this gift that God has given you and quit delaying it and become a Christian. And if you're here and you're subject for the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.
Let's remember the white man now. He's home to see. Uh, I know it's a Wednesday night and not all the men are here, but uh, since me and Jensen took over the exhorter, I want to update the uh, men and their ability to do whatever they want to do. So I'm going to try to have some uh, sheets at the back Sunday morning so you can sign up and we can get that updated because we know that there's been several that were baptized and they may be willing to serve. So uh, I just want you to be thinking what you want to do. Okay. There's 46 here, Stephen. Stephen's local company is coming in. So we got 46 tonight. Yeah, 46. It's a good number. And we appreciate you being here. And we're thankful for you. And we uh, hope you have a good holiday. If there's nothing else, we'll. Bruce is supposed to leave in the closing period. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and all its many blessings. Thank you for bringing us here tonight to sing songs and study another portion of your word. Dear Lord, please be with the sick. Help them get back to their most wanted need help, it be thy will. As we're about to separate, please go with us. Guide, guard, and direct us. And in the end, if we've been found faithful, give us a home with thee in heaven. Please forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.